Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase every day. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase every day. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. Just a quick heads up before we get started today. There's a little swearing in this episode. Okay, you've been warned. On Thursday, March 7th, the trade group Airlines for America held a board meeting in Washington, D.C. The group represents the big passenger airlines in the U.S. and some of the cargo carriers. And one of the major topics of this meeting was, what are we going to do about Boeing? That's John Ostrower, the editor-in-chief of the website The Air Current. At the meeting, John says, the CEOs of American Airlines, United, Southwest, and Alaska talked about the Boeing problem. They wanted to find a way to move forward with where Boeing is today. And they wanted to, the CEOs put their heads together. They said, okay, how do we understand what the path forward is for Boeing? And I don't think going into that meeting, they wanted to force the board and the CEO and the head of Boeing Commercial to leave. I think what they wanted to do was seek clarity about how Boeing was going to move forward from the board directors without the presence of the CEO. And they had a pretty choice description of what they wanted. In talking to one longtime, very knowledgeable senior industry leader, they put it this way. They didn't want to get the defensive bullshit. They wanted the board to hear it directly through them, quote, end quote. That meant a conversation with the board without CEO Dave Calhoun. Because what happened on Alaska Flight 1282, when a loose door plug caused an explosive decompression, was just one incident in a long list of concerns these CEOs had. And their airlines fly a lot of Boeing planes. And so they wanted to get rid of the filter. But here's the thing, when you, when you say you want to get rid of the filter, it sends a message. Whether you intended to force a leadership change or not, that act became a very symbolic vote of no confidence in Boeing's leadership. And the board this past weekend met on a teleconference and decided it was time to make a change. In an interview on CNBC, Dave Calhoun insisted this was his decision. I've always said to the board, and the board has been very prepared, I would give them plenty of notice so that they could understand and plan succession in, in regular order. And that's what and this is about. yes, John says Calhoun is 67, past the mandatory retirement age of 65. Anyone who says that Boeing planned to have the board of directors not seek re-election, the CEO announces resignation uh, and retirement for the end of the year and the head of the commercial business leave immediately all in the same weekend is kidding themselves. That was not a planned event and they didn't want to do it that way. This was forced. This was absolutely forced by by the airlines and, and the customers who count on Boeing to be healthy. So today on the show, what will it take to get Boeing back on its feet and get the flying public to trust it again? I'm Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about technology, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase every day. 
That's 3% on your favorite products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank, USA, Salt Lake City branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you're driving, cooking, or doing laundry, Progressive knows the podcasts you listen to go best when they're bundled with another activity. Much like how their Progressive home and auto policies go best when they're bundled. Having these two policies together makes taking care of your insurance easier and could help you save, too. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. That's a whole lot of savings and protection for your favorite podcast listening activities, like going on a road trip, cooking dinner, even hitting the home gym. Yep, your home and your car are even easier to protect when you bundle your insurance together. Find your perfect combo. Get a home and car insurance quote at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Even if this year were to end right now, in March, it would still be a pretty rough one for Boeing. January began with the Alaska 1282 incident when the door plug of a 737 MAX 9 blew out shortly after takeoff. That led to the grounding of the MAX 9 aircraft and an FAA audit, which found multiple instances where Boeing failed to comply with manufacturing quality control requirements. From then, seemingly every incident involving a Boeing plane has been in the news, from a stuck rudder pedal to a falling tire to a mid-air dive on a 787 caused by a pilot seat switch position. Some of these issues are small and none caused major injuries, but they form a disquieting narrative. I think what we see when we, when we hear about all these things getting lumped in together is that Boeing has not earned itself any defenders in the last 15 years of how it's behaved as a, as a company. And that goes back to, uh, you know, actually even more than 15 years, probably, probably more like 25, you know, moving the company from Seattle to Chicago, selling off parts of its business to create Spirit Aero Systems, a deliberate strategy to break its workforce. And then you take three years of struggles for with the 787 development, you take a getting through that and then turning around and saying, hey, suppliers, we need you to pay for this incredibly expensive development so we can be profitable on this. And they took 15% of the supplier margin, generally speaking. But that created an entirely black, deep pool of mistrust in Boeing's ecosystem with its suppliers, with its uh, with its employees. And what we saw through the crashes of Lion Air and Ethiopian in 2018 and 2019, that the rift was extended to the FAA and global regulators. Those two crashes on 737 MAX 8 airplanes killed 346 people and led to the grounding of all 737 MAX planes from March 2019 to December 2020. Boeing has a deep, deep strategic trust problem. Boeing for two and a half decades has acted in a way that has caused it to have this landscape in front of them. And fundamentally, there was a narrative that has that has been created, uh, much of it r- very, very real in terms of its acute problems in, in the factory and how it's conducted its business, that ultimately required a break. And the break was the leadership change, because you have to say, now it's time to do something different. Well, let's use that leadership change to talk about the last four plus years, the Dave Calhoun years at Boeing. He took over in December of 2019 after the two awful 737 MAX 8 crashes and the board on which he sat fired the previous CEO, Dennis Mullenberg. And at the time, there was a lot of talk about we are going to change the culture. We are going to change our processes. How much of that happened? Mullenberg was a, is a consummate engineer 
engineers are not known for their warm and fuzziness. He's a very calculated, very deliberate speaker and thinker, had a, you know, a binder multiple inches thick that he traveled with, with all of the company policy positions and status. So he could, could and, and had encyclopedic knowledge of all that. And he was really, really good at keeping all that straight. But when it came time to communicate the, nece- the necessary empathy and contrition that the company, I think, wanted to find in itself, it couldn't. And I think there was a function of a lot of things. The Mullenberg strategy was during the course of 2019, when the airplane was grounded in its first year, was really rooted in how you avoid legal liability hmm. and how you minimize the, the company's exposure. Suits from passenger families, et cetera. Exactly, exactly. And so, so much of that was, was geared, I mean, I think they had to walk this very uncomfortable fine line where they were over-optimizing for their legal strategy and effectively in a very calculated way to avoid that level of responsibility could, they couldn't articulate any kind of empathy in the process. So it's not just an inability for a leader to, to communicate that and communicate that in a way, in a genuine way. It's also the company was trying to avoid that. And so Calhoun comes in and Calhoun is a very different communicator than Mullenberg. And that was the first thing, the most obvious thing that changed. There was an embrace of, we have to do things differently. We know we've damaged and trust and we need to re-earn it. And and a very kind of contrite, forward-leaning view of like, we have to fix this. We have to fix the culture. But you wrote at the time that that Calhoun helped create that culture when he was on the board. Well, that's exactly it, right? Calhoun absolutely was involved in uh, many of the, the, the strategies that got Boeing to this point in the first place. He was the longest serving board member appointed in 2009. Calhoun was on the board through all of the strategic decisions that that took place. So the very uncomfortable reality for a guy like Dave Calhoun is you ask, okay, were you were you there blessing this strategy and actively agreed with it or were you asleep at the switch when these decisions were being made? And that is the part of this that has never never been fully healed with respect to how those around Boeing, including the families of the victims and, and, and the airlines and, 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 and everyone that was touched by the, the Lion Air and Ethiopian grounding, saw that and was like, why are you the right guy to run this company, given everything that's been cultivated over the last 15 years? One description of that strategy is a focus on financialization, on shareholder value, and less of a focus on manufacturing excellence. Do you think that's an accurate description? I think they they wanted to have their cake and eat it too, except they only wanted the frosting, right? Someone put it to me the other day that free cash flow for companies is like heroin. You know, once you get it, it just sort of, you just, you want more of it. And you want, and it, cause that's the thing that, 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 begins to drive you. And I think that Boeing always assumed that safety and quality were baseline. They were table stakes and they would, that that was always the assumption. You never violated that. And you could, you could optimize for, uh, for cash flows and, and, and and high production and, and all of the, uh, pre-delivery payments that come in during the course of an airplane production system. And they thought that they could do it without affecting the basic functionality of the enterprise. And the answer is wrong. In addition to blaming cost-cutting measures, a lot of reporting has focused on high turnover among Boeing's workforce. During the pandemic, Boeing lost thousands of employees to layoffs, buyouts, retirements, and resignations. The theory goes that this loss of expertise is leading to sloppy production. But John's not convinced. This is a business where every, you know, five, seven, 10 years is a huge exogenous shock, whether it's 9-11 or SARS or, or the financial crisis or you know, the, the pandemic, where these things happen. That's just like a normal part of doing business in the, in, in, the, in the airline industry, right? John says one of the things that weakened Boeing happened long before the pandemic. It was a program designed to cut costs while racing to keep up with rival Airbus. The program's name was Partnering for Success. And as one very senior uh, supplier executive that works very closely with Boeing dubbed it to me that it's, it, he called it, you know, PFS was uh, an acronym for pretty fucking stupid. And that ultimately hollowed out so much of the supply chain's resilience. At its core, 
Partnering for Success, which began in 2012, demanded that Boeing's suppliers cut their prices even while keeping production unchanged. And so they went to them and said, you know, I think there was an initial like, hey, we, we want to work with you to get 15% or 20% out of your what you're what you're selling to us. And how do we help you do that? And the and the uh suppliers were like, well, okay, we just got through this incredibly astronomically expensive development with you. Um, how do how do we do that? Because we're paying for it too, and we helped you get over the finish line. And you know, you're asking us to help you get profitable on this, on this program. And I think it probably started off in a, in a nice way. And then it quickly turned to, you need to give us 15% or we're taking the work across the street. But the problem is that when you take 15% out of a supplier, they can't invest in their own operation and the resilience of their own operation. And so it cascades, right? And it compounds. The program, which began under CEO Jim McNerney, was extended under Dennis Mullenberg, all while Boeing was earning record revenue. During this particular period, they were, they were, there was tens of billions of dollars of free cash flow coming into the company and being returned to investors, and they were buying back the shares at three and four hundred dollars. Yeah. Which was a terrible idea. Objectively, a terrible idea. Not exactly. Certainly increases your share price. It absolutely does, because obviously it reduces the number of shares in the market and and increases the value of it. And so you're optimizing for the wrong things. And so what ends up happening is the supply chain consolidates because you can't make money anymore with how these cost pressures are, are, are flowing down. And so you have a consolidation. And oh, by the way, as suppliers are getting bigger and more consolidated, what are they doing? They are passing those... Uh, those cuts down onto the tiers that supply them, and, and so on and so on. This system went full steam ahead until 2019 and 2020 when Boeing was hit with two catastrophes. The crashes that forced them to ground their fleet of MAX airplanes and COVID-19. So when you hit the pandemic, you have a collapse in demand, massive, unbelievable, unprecedented collapse in demand that uh, that effectively said, well, airlines don't want airplanes and they won't don't want airplanes for several years because no one's flying. So what happens? Everything grinds to a halt. Boeing made a decision at the beginning of 2020, end of 2019 to stop 737 MAX production. And they had been running at 42 per month while they weren't even delivering airplanes. And so they amassed this huge inventory of airplanes that they um, that they couldn't deliver because the airplane was grounded. And then you had airlines, you know, six weeks later who were like, uh, I, I, I have no passengers. Right. And so ultimately what happened was it just, re- the pandemic revealed the fragility and instability that had been engineered into the system based on the decisions that were made in the, in the previous decade. Dave Calhoun says he's staying through the end of the year. A new CEO will come in and run this company. How much does that next CEO matter? Because a change of CEOs four and a half years ago, did not stop the issues we are now discussing. This is about leadership and about making some really, really hard decisions. Boeing doesn't have a demand problem. They have an operational strategy problem. And that requires, number one, you need a CEO who first and foremost will tell Wall Street to take a walk for at least several years. Like, if you want to hang on the sidelines, cool, great. But this is not going to be the cash cow you think it is because it is not a healthy company at the moment. The CEO matters hugely. But I would say the team the CEO surrounds themselves with is even more important because, you know, I was having a conversation with someone the other day about this, that like, this is like, you know, remember March of the Penguins? Remember the scene? Yes. Right. Remember the scene where they're all in Antarctica and they're all huddled up in like this brutal winter and they kind of like circle up to protect themselves. Wall Street is Antarctica. Okay. And it's trying to kill them. And that new leadership team needs to huddle up and link arms and say, we have to save this company. And that is what this is all about. And so any CEO who has anything less than that as their first priority is going to fail and Boeing is going to continue to struggle or worse. When we come back... Who's investigating Boeing and for what? First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. 
but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now, getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase every day. That's 3% on your favorite products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank, USA, Salt Lake City branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. I want to talk about some near-term stuff and some longer-term stuff. Um, Near-term, the National Transportation Safety Board is still trying to figure out exactly what happened on Alaska 1282. You talked to the chair of the board. What did she tell you? Well, it's, it's really interesting. I, I think the they're trying to figure out, number one, not who forgot to put the bolts in the door. I think that's really important. The, the, the chair you know, said it's not about the names on the list. It's about the culture and it's about the process and it's about the structure by which Boeing is operating that causes something like this to happen. At a Senate hearing earlier this month, NTSB Chair Jennifer Hammondy told Washington Democrat Maria Cantwell about her team's struggle to get documentation on this incident from Boeing. Does the fact that Boeing has not produced these documents or that NTSB investigators have not been able to retrieve them indicate that they do not exist or ever existed? They may not. There are two options. Either they exist and we don't have them, or they do not exist, which raises two very different questions, several different questions, depending on which one is the right answer. Boeing ultimately concluded that the documents don't exist. And the problem is that the documents don't exist because they never cataloged the bolts coming out and back in. That's effectively the conclusion there, which Oof. speaks to a very, very sloppy manufacturing process. Look, the, 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 the old joke in, in aerospace is that you can only uh, fly the airplane when the paperwork weighs as much as the airplane. It's called traceability. You need to know yeah. what, what, how, how it was put together, all that. And absent that, you have an incomplete picture of, of what happened. But Fundamentally, what the NTSB is getting at here, and I think this is really, really important, that assigning blame to one mechanic in Rendon who forgot to put the bolts back in or it wasn't cataloged properly so there was no documentation on the front end. So there's nothing, to, you know, if you don't open something, there's nothing to close, right? That speaks to the scope of the investigation. This is an investigation about how Boeing operates its factories. Not about one flight. Precisely. Then, last week, passengers on Alaska 1282 reported receiving a letter from the FBI saying they may have been victims of a crime, and the Department of Justice has been investigating the flight. Boeing largely avoided criminal prosecution for the Lion Air and Ethiopian crashes by reaching an agreement with the DOJ and paying $2.5 billion. In the case of Alaska 1282, John says there is an active effort in the Justice Department to understand what happened. 
I think one of the things when you think about the documentation that is available to to Boeing and the NTSB around how this airplane came together, one of the things we reported back in um, back at the end of January was we we sort of dissected how the airplane came together. And one of the key pieces about how the airplane came together was not actually about the door. It was what led up to the door being opened. And there were five fasteners next to the door along the side of the fuselage. And one of the things that that has become really clear is that those fasteners, which were not properly uh, installed at Spirit Aerosystems, when it got to Renton for actually being becoming an airplane, they found these bolts and they said, well, this is this is not right. These fasteners aren't, 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 aren't being put in properly and they're damaged. Well, they come back a few days later and the fasteners were painted over. And that is not how you handle discrepant fasteners in a commercial aircraft. That is a, that is, that's a really troubling thing. What is the FAA's role and responsibility here? Because certainly a lot of fingers pointed at the FAA and the way they had delegated some responsibilities to Boeing in the wake of the Lion Air and Ethiopian crashes. And I wonder where the FAA sits in this current situation. I don't envy the FAA at all in this situation. They have been put in this situation fundamentally because of not just the Alaska situation, but the development of the MAX, which gave them a tremendous black eye in terms of their role globally as the gold standard for aircraft certification. So what ends up happening is as authority is delegated to Boeing for a lot of the certification, by the way, a system based on trust, that it's going to be done done correctly and, and, and comprehensively. The problem is its implementation and how, how it unfolded at Boeing. So FAA gets this, this horrible black eye and it, and it creates a rift among itself. For the FAA right now, there's a tight rope that you have to walk, which is which is how do you enforce and 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 get Boeing to a point where they are healthy in the factory at a really tactical level, like like running a factory that is to the standard that they expect, and also how you help them compel broader change to enable that. It's not that they need to fix what's, you know, the safety and quality of the airplanes. Yes, they absolutely have to do that. But they also, I think there's been an increasing recognition at FAA and DOT that Boeing itself has to change to allow this to stick. FAA and DOT and even DOD can't come out and ask for a leadership change of Boeing. But what they can do is piss off those who can, which leads us right back to where we started, the U.S. Airlines saying there's no confidence in the leadership. Well, there is, I wouldn't say no confidence, but there has also been decreased confidence among people who get on airplanes every day um, about Boeing. I mean, a number of articles of, you know, people looking up on this and that website, what kind of aircraft they're getting on, et cetera. Um, Over the last five years, you have repeatedly tried to gauge how people feel about MAX airplanes and about Boeing. How do they feel now? In the case of Boeing, there has actually been a remarkably consistent chunk of the public that has been very reticent about Boeing airplanes. I asked the same question on my Twitter feed. It's a 135,000 followers. You get a good sample. And not scientific, but the results are remarkably consistent and uh, very closely tied to the events that happen around them. And so coming into the Alaska accident, about 70 to 75 percent of folks had for the last two years been saying, yes, I'm comfortable getting on a 737 MAX airplane. However, I asked the question again last week. And the number came in around 40% of folks who said, no, I do not feel comfortable flying a 737 MAX. And by the way, that number of 40% mirrors what Boeing itself measured in December of 2019, just before it fired Dennis Mullenberg. And so, again, I don't know if this is causing people to book away from a 737 MAX. Certainly, there are anecdotes here and there. You've got, you've got you know, options on kayak to, to filter. But I think there are two sins committed by by Boeing in, in, 
that are above all the others when it comes to the flying public. Number one, their conduct around the death of 346 people on these two flights. Number two was a a sin against the flying public more broadly was making them think about what airplane they got on. And that in an, an environment where aviation is so phenomenally safe, there was not a single passenger fatality on a large aircraft in 2023. Zero. Like literally it's more dangerous for me to walk to my kitchen than it is for me to fly on an airplane. In that context, making people think about what they're boarding causes tremendous damage to trust in the airlines that they fly and in turn, Boeing itself. And that's what all of this is about. And why has there been so much attention, this ferocious attention that, that, that even little minor incidents that would otherwise be totally unremarkable and normal in the, in the daily life of, of an airline, broken windshield, delayed flight, warning light, these things take on an outsized significance, not because they're, they have an outsized significance, but because of how we feel about how Boeing has conducted its business and caused us to not trust what it says and what it does. And that is the, the number one responsibility and task for any CEO in the team that they build coming in going forward. John Ostrower, thank you for your reporting and for being so generous with your time today. My pleasure. John Ostrower is editor-in-chief of The Air Current. And that is it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell, Anna Phillips, and Patrick Fort. Our show is edited by Paige Osborne. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of Audio for Slate, and TBD is part of the larger What Next family. If you are a fan of what we're doing here, then I have a request for you. Become a Slate Plus member. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. All right, we'll be back on Sunday with another episode. I'm Lizzie O'Leary. Thanks for listening. Why don't more infant formula companies use organic, grass-fed whole milk instead of skim? Why don't more infant formula companies use the latest breast milk science? Why don't more infant formula companies run their own clinical trials? Why don't more infant formula companies use more of the proteins found in breast milk? Why don't more infant formula companies have their own factories instead of outsourcing their manufacturing? We wondered the same thing. So we made Byheart, a better formula for formula. Learn more at byheart.com.